section is look at whole person involvement in this thing we call children's choirs. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in what we're going to do with the voice that we forget about the whole body, the whole person experience. Um, and some of what I'm going to share has been shaped for me by starting a worship and fine arts program for Southeast Michigan 10 years ago, in which I moved to an area which I didn't know much about. It's the Detroit area. I knew that it was the auto industry and that we had plummeted both in terms of economics and also we were still living in the 60s and 70s in terms of racial and economic divide where certain lot roads that are the have side and the have not side. Um, but a church and a, and a geographic region of the Lutheran Church called me to start a fine arts program for the area. And our first job was simply to find out who the people were and who the children were. And what a lesson it was for all of us. We spent one whole year just getting to know the community and the people who were there. And what were their needs? What were they looking for? What opportunities did they have already? And what opportunities didn't they have along the way? We found out there were plenty of opportunities for kids who had money to pay for private lessons or to be in the Ann Arbor Boys Choir or things like that. But for the children who were at risk in their school systems, either intellectually, academically, or socially, or just even from broken homes or financially, there really wasn't anything being offered. So a brave little church in Livonia, Michigan, a first-ring suburb of Detroit, decided to make this one of their mission efforts to start a program. And to top it all off, after I got there, I found out that the history of Livonia was that it was a white supremacist city. And I didn't know they existed in the north, you know. And, um, and I learned that in the 60s, flight from, white flight from the city, that people went to Livonia. And if you were um, of an, an African American or another color, we'll say, you could be arrested for walking on the streets. And so all of a sudden, the mission and ministry became even greater because there were still remnants of that, you know, they don't disappear overnight, and if that's what you grew up with, that's what's still in your person along the way. I do believe that children are going to make the difference. They're going to change things. And one of our goals is that children will see color, appreciate it, value it, and respect it. I don't think that we should think that there is no color in the world, that we're all the same, because then it would be rather bland and boring. But if we can see color and value it rather than be afraid of it, um, literally, the whole world will brighten up and will be a much more exciting and rich place for all of us to live in. So that being said, um, I entitled our first session, Hearts, Hands, and Voices, Working with the Whole Person. I stole those words from Martin Rinkhart. They're also the name of our fine arts program in Southeast Michigan. They're coming from the hymn, Now Thank We All Our God, with hearts, hands, and voices, and they really describe the whole person experience along the way. And so to kick off our time, I brought a little children's illustrated book. It's called The Cat's Midsummer January, and I'd like to share the short story with you because I think it describes who we are and what we are all about. And so the story goes like this, and the interesting thing, it was given to me from, by my preschool children 25 years ago, and I think the truths still hold for us today. There once was a cat who loved to sing, strumming his mandolin, he would roam and sing, roam and sing, dance and sing. I'll show you a couple of the characters <laughs> along the way. One day, to his surprise, he came upon a toad playing an harmonica in an old oak tree. Why do you hide your music, asked the cat. Only the old oak branches and the old oak trunk can hear you playing. And we see. I don't need to be seen, and I don't care if I have heard, answered the toad. I just like to play for myself. That's how it is with me, the cat said, but your music is pleasing to my ear. And if you were to join me, we would make a duet. 
and then what is worth going on the road with? <laughs> that certainly would be different, answered the toad, and together they went. It wasn't long before they heard a sound coming from the meadow of ferns, and peering around a tree, they saw a fox tooting her flute. What are you doing out there by yourself? asked the cat. I'm playing my song, answered the fox. But your music is so good to hear, the cat replied, and if you will join us, we will make a trio. And you know, a trio is worth going on the road. <laughs> I think I will, answered the fox, and all together they went. They were playing so loudly and so happily and so proudly that they danced right by a badger banging his drum. Hey, you, and you, and you, exclaimed the badger. Didn't you hear me keeping time to music with my drum? I heard you coming long before I could see what you were. We're a trio, replied the cat proudly. What are you doing up there on your mound beside the hole all by your lonesome self? <clears throat> Why, I'm banging away, as everyone can see, the badger replied. So bang on your drum to accompany our tune, and then we'll be a quartet, said the cat. And you know, a quartet is worth traveling on the road. And off they went. They heard a melody drifting over a hill. The cat stopped and pointed in the direction of the sound being made by a violin that they could now see was being played by a skunk. Why don't you join us, asked the cat, because if you do, we'll make a quintet. I will, said the skunk, but you mustn't go too fast and you can't play so loud that my violin won't be heard. And so off they went, a ringing quintet, slow enough to be heard if anyone wished to hear. While crossing over a log in the middle of a pond, they spotted a goose playing a bassoon. I don't think the fish can hear you, said the cat, and no one else is around. So why don't you join us, and we'll have a sextet. Six is my lucky number, answered the goose, and that's the only excuse I will need to join your group. So the badger took up the lead, the goose brought up the rear, and all together they went. And finally they came to a tree at the edge of the meadow, and there, high in its branches, a raccoon could be seen and heard playing an accordion. The cat called up, come with us and we will have a jamboree. Um, but the raccoon answered, if you come up here, our music will carry to all who wish to hear. And that's what they did. And as the raccoon predicted, they were heard far and near. And so the musicians became a jamboree in a tree. And others came from far and near, players and listeners, and cheerers and revelers, and acrobats and jugglers, until the world of that place was filled with the happiness that all began with the cat who loved to sing. I believe that you are that cat in your sphere of influence. And like that cat, inviting whoever comes in the cat's pathway, we welcome all into our fold. And you know what? I would guess that you probably have characters like that in your choir as well. I know I do along the way. But imagine, first of all, the cast of characters. So we have an instrumental ensemble of mandolin, harmonica, flute, violin, bassoon, and accordion. That doesn't get any more wild than that <laughs> along the way. And then the cast of performers. We start with the cat, then he visits a toad, and then we have the fox, and then we have a badger, and we have a goose, and we have a skunk, and we have a raccoon by the way at the end. And the interesting thing is, some of them just come automatically. Others have some things to say about it. 
First of all, did you notice when the cat and the group met the badger? The badger was banging his drum, but they didn't even notice them because they were so preoccupied with what they were doing. And this unnoticed musician ends up being the leader. He takes charge and leads the group ultimately on their little journey. Sometimes we have children like that in our room. They're kind of those quiet types sitting in the back of the room, and we don't notice them because they don't have a, an extrovert kind of personality, but ultimately could end up being one of your leaders along the way. My favorite, and I have a number of these in my room, is the skunk playing the violin, who came most, un most conditionally into the group. You can't play too loud, you can't do this because I need to be heard. <laughs> and we have people like that, but you know what, the cat didn't say, oh, you can't come because you have all of those conditions. The cat actually welcomed the skunk unconditionally, even though the skunk came unconditionally along the way. And then there's that goose playing the bassoon. And the goose didn't need any coaxing. What was the reason for joining the group? Six is my lucky number. <laughs> Kids are looking for belonging along the way. And sometimes we just need to invite them along the way. And sometimes we forget that an invitation is all it takes. And finally, there's that raccoon up in the tree. And what did he do when he was invited to join the group? He countered the invitation. He said, come on up here because more people will be able to hear us along the way. And you know what? I think sometimes we forget to listen to what our children might suggest to us along the way. They can maybe do greater things than we could ever think or imagine with them. I know that when I first started teaching in California, I taught in a private parochial school for 10 years. And, you know, I was always worried when the principal was going to come in and watch because everything had to be in order and blah, 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 blah. And finally, I gave up on that. And I decided we would have times called creative chaos. In our and creative chaos meant that that's when the, we were taking suggestions from the class and they might be working in small groups to help create the experience that we were about to embark upon. And when the principal would come in, i said, it's just creative chaos time, don't worry, we've got, it's planned, okay? But, but we get into this habit of we have to have everything in quiet and everything in order, and all of a sudden it stifles the creativity, and the children become afraid to <coughs> offer their suggestions to us. Does that mean the whole rehearsal is up for grabs? Absolutely no. not. <laughs> but we have those times where we welcome their suggestions. Um, I mean, that was a real privilege to work in that place because we had music four times a week in that school. Two days of general music, K through eight, and then two days of choir, K through eight. And then wow. preschool had music twice a week also. I mean, that, I just lived there in, in, that, in that school. Um, but it was incredible to see what could happen over the period of four days in a row. It's that repetition. Research tells us that if you can repeat something within 24 hours, it will stick with us. But if we wait a week, oh my gosh, that's a long time for the body memory to forget and then you have to kind of start over along the way. But we, we have those kinds of experiences and I thought maybe what would be fun for us to do, knowing that all of those different kinds of learners come to us, Maybe, to first of all, determine what kind of learner are you <laughs> along the way? Have you ever thought about the way in which you like to learn, or the ways in which you like to learn? I'm going to give you a little simple test <laughs> right now. It's only three questions, and the answers are A, B, or C. Okay, so all you have to do is remember A, B, or C for the three questions. And I want to read those questions to you carefully. So here is the first one. When you were in school, which of the following activities did you like best and learn from most effectively? A, reading a textbook and highlighting important points. Or B, attending lectures and taking notes. C, doing lab experiments, participating in practicums or internships. Okay, A, B, C, got them? Second question, when you are learning something new today, 
Which of the following methods is most useful to you? A. Carefully reading and following written instructions on your own. B. Getting an experienced person to talk to you and tell you about, about it and how to do it. Or C. Experimenting on your own. And last and final question for this little survey. Number three. As you continue to grow in your craft and art, which of the following statements might be true for you? A. You read professional journals and newsletters, thereby allowing you to read and reread the material, check the facts if you don't understand something along the first go-around. B. You seek out others to tell you what's new in your area, thereby obtaining the most latest and recent research and efforts in your field. Or C. You observe situations and draw conclusions for yourself. Now, maybe in one of those questions you may say, oh, I'm kind of between you. Just choose one <laughs> right now, okay? So, I'll just ask this question. How many of you felt like you had a lot of A answers in yours? Mm -hmm. And B answers? And C answers? It's about one third, one third, one third. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. That's what always happens. Happens that way. Well, anyway. But if you primarily answered A, for you, your eyes are your primary ways of learning. You are a visual learner. That is neither a good thing or a bad thing. It is your reality, and that's the way you learn best. Um, if you answer B, you are primarily, primarily a person who learns with your ears. You like to take in, listen, and then draw conclusions for yourself. Now, a caution with that, if you're a person who likes to learn with your ears, your classroom is going to, if you have learners like this, is going to be filled with people who um, like to have their own individual interpretation and expression along the way. And I think that's probably true for you, maybe, along the way. <laughs> and thirdly, um, if, if you answered the C, you're probably um, a kinesthetic learner, kind of a whole body experience. And it doesn't take place just with the mind, or the ears, or the eyes, but also the hands, the feet, the face, this part of the body. The caution about this one, of all of the three types of learning, it provides the most opportunities for imagination, creativity, and interaction with other people. For as many people, that's frightening or scary. That can lead to chaos, <laughs> or creative chaos. Um, but knowing that we have that that's our group of learners here and that's something true about ourselves, what research has shown us is that the way we like to learn is the way we like to teach. So if we are primarily a visual learner, we will teach that way. If we are primarily an oral learner, we will teach that way. If we are primarily a kinesthetic learner, we will teach that way. But guess what? You're going to be missing, in this case, two-thirds of the group if you are just teaching in the way that you like to learn. So maybe I can encourage you along the way that at the top of your rehearsal or your lesson plans, you just write the word back. Visual, auditory, and kinesthetic there. And with each piece that you do, list ways in which you might enable learning through the eyes, through the ears, through the whole body experience. And would you do it all in one rehearsal? Probably not. But you can build upon it so that by the end of the experience with a particular piece of music or material, you will have hit all of the ways of learning and hopefully not the entire group to participate in it. And so, what I thought we might do is do some experiences in that, an auditory experience, and then build on that and add other kinds of things in, in maybe a systematic way. All of this, though, says that you have to learn who your learners are along the way. And I, I would never give my kids the survey that you did, or even as in, but you can watch them the way they learn in different kinds of experiences that you give them. Say, oh, Sally is learning best this way, Joe is learning best this way. So you make notes of all of that, and then consider what might work best for a particular piece as the initial experience, 
and then follow up with other kinds of experiences. And then also consider the motivation for, for those learners because sometimes learners will come with, um, I, want, I want to be here, I want to do it. That's all the motivation they need. Others get their excitement in um, being motivated for the final product down the way. Others need a payoff, like M&Ms or something. <laughs> and still others love being in the process of things. And that would be my favorite way if, if we as teachers and, and rehearsal instructors would stay in process, the end is going to be so much greater than we ever imagined. Because if we have a product in mind, we have this here, but the children might say it could go to here, but we've limited it by just dealing with product rather than the process. So, some experiences along the way. Sometimes we get in front of a class and say, I have a new song I want to teach for you today, and it goes like this. Great, but wouldn't it be great if we could put it in cultural context for them? You know, I was talking to some friends, and I know that in the country of Liberia, in Africa, when they go to worship or to church, there is someone standing in the front of their worship gathering who sings some words to the people who are coming, and all of those people sing the words back to them. We're going to worship like the people in Liberia do to do today. So I'm going to be the caller at the front of the gathering, and you are the people coming to worship. Okay, and this is what the caller is singing. Come, let us eat for now the feast is spread. Come, let us eat for now the feast is spread. Come, let us eat for now the feast is spread. Come, let us eat for now the feast is spread. Our Lord's body let us take together. Our Lord's body let us take together. Our Lord's body, let us take together. Our Lord's body, let us take together. But you know what? They're not being invited just to any old meal. They're being invited to the best meal in the whole wide world, to God's special meal. Do you think you could show that with your eyes and your bodies that you're being invited? Oh, all of a sudden the eyes might come open and you might come forward on those chairs, okay? <laughs> come, let us see for now the feast is spread. Come, let us see for now the feast is spread. Come, let us see for now the feast is spread. Come, let us see for now the feast is spread. Our Lord's body, let us take together. 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 End of rehearsal one. Did I fix anything along the way? I didn't say specifically. However, inviting you to the best meal ever can change the character. And you sang with more energy the second go around. You also had a second time to hear the piece. Okay, day number two. <laughs> you know, last time we were worshiping like the people in Liberia. And today I was wondering, instead of me being the caller, could you all call me to worship? Okay, go for it. Ready? I'll help you. And come, let us see for now the feast is spread. Come, let us see for now the feast is spread. Come, let us see for now the feast is spread. Come, let us see for now the feast is spread. Our Lord's body, let us sing together. Our Lord's body, let us take together. Our Lord's body, let us take together. Our Lord's body, let us take together. Did I say you're singing sloppily? No. When I responded to you, I responded in like manner. And when I heard it, it's like, oh my gosh, were we really singing like that? No. Yes, you were. I <laughs> 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 say the clock. <laughs> Okay, so we might, we might have that call, and we might say, oh, could this side of the room call this side, could this side of the room call that side? But you know, sometimes people are so excited to go to that meal that they jump the gun, and they don't wait for the caller to get finished, okay? <laughs> Let's get those eyes and bodies ready to jump the gun. Come, let us eat for now the feast is Now 
now, boys and girls, we're going to sing a canon together. <laughs> You're going to start, I'm going to start, you're going to follow. No fun. More fun <laughs> to be engaged in the whole notion of we can't wait to come and respond to this call along the way. So I do know that in Tanzania in particular, where my experience is, that they would never just sit there and sing. They would get everything out of their laps and either stand or be sitting up tall. And they would add, most often, not a fancy rhythmic beat, but simply a clap for everything. Come, let us eat more, now the feast is spread. So could you get that going up in the air? all together. Each time you have that, the energy has surged because we've added a new element of our person. We've kind of moved from the total oral experience in adding the kinesthetic experience. Now, you could also consider what you were doing here with the claps a visual one. Notice I didn't have you clap down here, but it was always like this because it lifts up our vocal tone rather than hammering it into the ground. It's all those little subtle things that make a difference along the way. So, let's say, end of that rehearsal, done with, we're getting ready to do this for worship. And you're hearing this from your group. Come, let us eat for now the feast to spread. And well, first of all, we have to put an ending at the end of the phrase. Could you hold out your hand like this and catch the final consonant of that? And we're going to practice it like this. Come, let us eat for now the feast to spread. Ready? Here we go. Come, let us eat for now the feast to spread. And they will always put it together as long as it has a point to go to. Now, if the D sounds too heavy, flip your hand on this side and put it like this so it floats in the air. Ready? Here we go. Come, let us eat for now the feast is spread. Come, you got the idea. Now, that opening word for some kids will pose a problem. Even though it's not high, it's only a C. Um, they will say, come, because we speak come, you know, not open. But when, when we go to singing English, it's very different. And so I might suggest to my, my children at that point, you know what, how many of you have seen those big alligator or crocodile mouths? They're quite long. They might look like this if we were trying to imitate them. And I'm wondering if right now you could be a crocodile mouth, and we're going to open our mouths for come like this. And so because come, let us see for now the feast is spread. And then we go on. Okay, get your crocodiles ready and come, let us see for now the feast is spread. Come, let us see for now the feast is spread. You got the idea. And all of a sudden, I didn't have to say open your mouths wide or do all of that. Simply, this suggests the lift you're going to have in your mouth along the way. So, not only is it a kinesthetic rep representation of what you want them to, but it's all a visual one. Oh yes, I have to have my mouth tall. I could say, I want you to lift and put it in the upper palate, you know, <laughs> tall. Like, oh my gosh, forget that one. <laughs> but they can do it along the way. So, all of that starting very simple, simply, and moving on by adding other elements of the body to the experience along the way. Sometimes we can start out with all of them at once. Um, um, our dear friend Helen Kemp, and who I refer to as my musical grandmother along the way, and that's how I introduce her to my kids, is that my musical grandmother said, there were four things I needed to get ready if I truly wanted to sing well and worship the best I could along the way. And this is how she taught it to me. And I'm wondering if you could listen to what she taught me and tell me what four parts you need to get ready. And this is what she said. Body, mind, spirit, voice. It takes the whole person to sing and rejoice. And one of them is... Body, second one, mind, spirit, voice. 
and you put them all in order. Your kids might not do that the first time if it's brand new to them. So we would listen again and put them in order. But once we determine the correct order, they will go up in my room on the board forever and ever, at least for that year. <laughs> and as we are rehearsing it through the year, if we're working on a particular song, if they aren't engaging one of those elements, I simply walk up to the board and go, hmm, and I'll point to it. It's like, oh, we got to be thinking more or focusing more about what we're doing. Saves my voice. It also allows them to take ownership. Then go, how am I going to get my brain and my mind more focused along the way? We've used that chant many times throughout throughout its, its, its lifetime to just talk about the four kinds of voices that we have. Um, basically, the playground voice, sometimes called the shouting voice, I would call it the playground, not shouting. Um, speaking voice, whispering voice, and the singing voice. And those are all great, but there are other voices along the way. You can actually do the speaking voice with your light vocal mechanism and your heavy vocal mechanism. For me, as a male, my life vocal mechanism is, I am just so glad to be here today, using a falsetto for speaking. And your children can also do that. And that voice, speaking voice, comes closest to the singing voice because of the amount of air. We are becoming a culture in which children are speaking lower and lower and lower because we're using less breath and less support and because it's become the norm for all, sometimes singing also mm -hmm. in, in our culture. So I think we can just do this. And if you're a guy along the way, I gotta tell them the first day, got two voices, I never lost the one you have and I have my new voice. And I'll sing in both of them and they'll get the giggle and all that kind of stuff. But after a while, it just becomes the norm. And you know your voice as, as women also. Sometimes you are gifted as an alto, and it means you might have a certain range that's really good for you, and then another range that's not so good. I know I can sing up to a D of um, an octave above middle C. If I gotta hit the E and the F, I am in trouble. I have to get someone to help me. That might be true for an alto also to make a beautiful sound. Or you might have a child who can make that sound. Call on them to be your vocal models along the way. But let's take that chant and see what implications it has for us. So the first thing that <coughs> Helen said we need to get ready is? Bye. Bye. Okay, would you get your bodies ready? We're going to put everything we brought with us right now on the chairs. And we're just going to go for the 8 a.m. stretch, okay? If you would take it all the way up. And if you would meet the neighbor on this side of you in a friendly way, simply by going over like this. <laughs> and coming back to reach to the sky, meet the neighbor on the other side. Now, let's add one more element to it. As your hands are moving that way, your knees are going the other way, as you are able, okay? Here we go. And the other direction. All of a sudden, you have to let go of your hip joint, and that is so critical for supporting your breath and your sound along the way. Thank you very much. And shake those arms out at your side. And we're going to do some shoulder circles up and back, but we're going to use our elbows as our point of reference, because sometimes children need to know, what am I supposed to be moving? They'll go like this or all that kind But we want them to take those elbows and make a circle with them, and that gives us the most effective and efficient shoulder opening up. And then we might take those and do the opposite direction, up and forward, up and forward. And it's almost like you're going to start swimming along the way. You're pushing water back, letting that motion take you, and let your now upper torso come in front of you. Allow your hands to dangle, allow gravity to pull them towards the floor, and just enjoying that stretch. And then very slowly, one vertebrae at a time, come back to standing position. Taking your time all the way up. And with your newly lengthened spine, do those shoulder circles up and back one more time. For many people, including my children, that's a very different experience than the first shoulder shrug, because now we've got more space between our vertebrae. We live in a culture where we get so busy that we keep compressing the spine, and we know it happens to people as they get older. You know, they say, I lost an inch in my height. It's because of that compression of the spine. 
So if we can find ways to open it up, and we used to think it was just adults, but it's our children too. They live in such a harried world. My kids come from soccer, from this, and they, they've got a five minute interval between the two events, and we expect them to change on the spot, you know, to, and it's just ludicrous sometimes <laughs> along the way. So we can be working with our body that way. We can also invite our children to find some bumps behind their ears. They're just little tiny bumps here and lightly touch with our fingers and from that point to nod their heads. Rather than use their whole back, we want that neck joint to be free for singing. And you can do the same thing. The access point is just slightly lower, but then turn from side to side without using your back, just letting your head rotate at the top of your spine. Sometimes I bring a Mr. Bobblehead in to show what that might look like. Take a couple of nods. And from there, find your jaw hinge and give yourself a jaw massage. And take some chewing motions as if you are crunching something really big along the way. And then, if we could imagine seeing air, we're going to hold out our hand, grab that air, and we're going to take that air and yawn from what we think is our highest all the way down to our lowest. Here we go. And. Oh! Yeah. What that little gesture does is the kids are focusing on the gesture. They're not thinking about being silly with their ah! along the way, but also, more importantly, Doing the gesture connects the head or the light vocal register and brings it into the low range. And it gets rid of often that hiccup in the middle, where we, even for us as adults, where we have the shifting of our vocal register. Go for it one more time. And Good for you. And the last thing we're going to do to get our bodies ready, it comes with the Alexander Technique, and it's called Tracing the V. And the V starts by us lightly touching our sternum with our fingertips, and from that point we're going to trace a V to the tip of our shoulder. We're going to finish that V by going up, and then we're going to look for who's ever or whatever is next to us, and we might have to shift our bodies a little sideways. But we're going to take that V, and we're going to open it up, as if we were gathering something in our arms, and then we just let those arms dangle at our side. Let's do the same thing again. Starting so with the sternum, tracing the V to the tips of the shoulders, leading with your wrists all the way up, coming around as if you were scooping up something, keeping the rib cage lifted, shoulders easy pop, just shaking out those hands. Guess what? That's our singing posture. We've opened up ourselves this way, we've opened up ourselves this way, I haven't said sing tall, because if I do that, we do distortions of body. The goal is to open this way and open this way. And Alexander wasn't thinking about this, but I think it's genius that if we open this way and this way, we are making the sign of the cross and blessing our efforts that way. So we have that to get as much. Now we can add one more element to it. We're going to add a breath to it. On the way up, we're going to inhale through our nose. On the way down, we're going to exhale something called the whispered up, okay? I'll demonstrate first and then we'll do it together. So it sounds and looks like this. We have a lot more air inside, but we just have always decided to expel it way too quickly. Take your time and find that sternum, and here we go. Inhale, leading with your wrist all the way to the top, and then exhale. Keeping your rib cage lifted, shoulders ease apart, nothing to do, and then relaxing those arms and hands at your side. And Close your eyes if you're comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Leading with your wrists all the way to the top and exhale. Taking your time, keeping the rib cage lifted, shoulders easy apart. And then shaking those arms out to the other side. And don't worry about writing this all down in the session that we did 
I just was thinking of it. I, yesterday, there were extra handouts, and in the voice training session, we did some of this, and it's written all down step by step. But I know that those of you who've been writing it, that this part down, you'll remember it better because you've written it yourself. <laughs> okay, so number one was the body. Number two is? Body. Okay, like I said, my kids come from all different walks of life. Our Monday evenings, we start our program with a 15-minute meal. That's the tuition cost for the kids from Southeast Michigan, that a parent will make one meal during the year to serve all the other kids, and it's created a great community for us. After that 15 minutes are done, we have um, not quite an hour and a half to do the entire program, and I only have a couple minutes to get them focused into what they're doing. So I found this worked what works well. Um, as soon as you see me do something, friends, would you do it right after me? <laughs> Are both hands on your shoulder? We do a checkpoint along with you. No, where's your other hand? It's on my head. Okay, now we're going to go for some speed. <laughs> ah, then we become creatures of habit and we think we can predict. My room becomes totally quiet when I do that because I don't want to miss it. And all of a sudden, we've taken them out of their other world into a world of play, literally, but all of a sudden their brain is engaged. I do that for the first month. I never do that after that. Then the children are invited to be the teachers after that, and they help start the group. So if you thought this was fast, you should see the stuff they come <laughs> along the way. So body, mind, and we'll have a seat right now. The third one on the list is spirit. How would you describe spirit? And I would ask that of my children. Any ideas how you personally would describe spirit in this room? Oh, we're, we're all shy. <laughs> I just finished um, two weeks of doing all the children's choirs at Montreat for the Presbyterians. And so I asked them this question on the very first day. What is spirit for you? These were the answers I got. And they were, they were quite simple, but also quite profound at the same time. One child said, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the one who, the children who always answer with God, because they know that's the right answer in the church. <laughs> but Holy Spirit was pretty descriptive, you know, that we really talk about a specific part you know, or person of God. Another person said, it's the way I feel. Another person said, it's my attitude. Another person said, it's right here. And I, I said, all of those answers are great answers because they're all true for spirit. And we're going to use all of them in our rehearsal. The way I know what your spirits are like at a particular age is looking into your eyes. And I said, sometimes we can tell what people are feeling inside by looking at their face or their eyes. And it's something that in our culture sometimes we are afraid to do because it's very intimate along the way. I said, sometimes I can tell when a group is really tired, it's 8 o'clock in the morning, and they come with, oh my gosh, my eyes are so tired, and they're only half open along the way. And then sometimes I can see our spirits of anticipation because the eyes are wide open. I can't wait for what happens next. My favorite, and I use it often when we're singing songs with lots of words at a fast clip, show me what mischief or no good in your eyes it looks like. And also, they start doing all of these things, and it starts lifting up the muscles here, and they're prepared to do other things. And so all of those things, we end up talking about the eyes for as, as a way to tie them all together and just watch what's going on. Sometimes we cannot tell by the eyes because some children will look the same no matter what. So do not assume, this is just kind of a general, general thing along the way. There was one girl who sang last night in the youth cue choir concert who, I think she was enjoying it, but the whole time she stood there like this while the kids around her were kind of moving around. But we can't tell what her story is along, along the 
along the way. So body, mind, spirit, and the last one, <laughs> voice, okay? And for this one, I'm going to ask you to stand up one more time, and we might sing it like this with our hands and with our voices. I'll go first. Body, mind, spirit, voice. Ready, go. Body, mind, spirit, voice. It takes the whole person to sing and rejoice. It takes the whole person to sing and rejoice. And would you go for lots of breath as you're going up and let those hands just sing up there. I'll start. Body, mind, spirit, voice. Body, mind, spirit, voice. It takes the whole person to sing and rejoice. It takes the whole person to all together without me leading you and Body, mind, spirit, voice It takes a whole person to sing and rejoice What does the side of the room sound like? Body, mind, spirit, voice It takes a whole person to sing and rejoice What does this side look like? Body, mind, spirit, voice It takes a whole person to sing and rejoice Which of course they're going to come in a little bit later Okay, here we go Body, mind, spirit Okay, let's say, oh, let's try it in four parts along the way. This big deal, okay? You four are number one. One, two, three, four. Number two, one, two, three, four. Number three, one, two, three. And you in the back row there. Four. <laughs> okay, we got four equal groups. Now the cat's going to go faster. Body, mind, body, mind, etc. And here we go. Body, mind, spirit, mind, spirit, mind, spirit, mind. and stay on their own parts the whole time, okay? And from that we might move to saying, you know what, did you know that you were signing in another language? This is so, and this is me. And I don't tell them we're going to sing so and me right now, but I always do it two-handed, because it's easier for us to sing two-handed, to be in balance vocally for our body, and it, it helps us keep track of our hands. So after we've done that, I'll say, you know what, let's sing with our hands as pattern. I'll sing a pattern for you, and if you'll sing it after me. So me, so, so me. So me, so, so me. So me, do, do, do. So me, do, do, do. So la, so. So la, so. So fa, mi, re. I teach kind of a different way along the way in that it's not like this because it makes us sing that way. So you notice um, all, often I have a loose wrist and floating up here. So awesome. gives more space and allows to come out of the roof of your head. Would you do that for me? And so awesome. now would you sing so Go the other way, and so, so. And we know that fa is a culprit because it's that half step in there. So fa, and it looks like it also is <laughs> thumbs down. So when we do it, we go so fa and come up out of it to make it a ha fa. Ready? Here we go. So fa. and ear all in this little um, two-line chant. 
and it can be your reference point for all of the things that come in the future. Thank you for participating in the experience. And let's see how we We've got eight minutes, it says. We we'll take all eight of them. Um, we're going to do, try to do two more experiences. One of them, um, I did bring a new song along for you. I'm going to just say it that way today. And in this new song I brought along for you today, there is one sentence of words that keeps being sung over and over. I would like you to determine what is the sentence that is sung over and over. Lift up your voice and sing. Rise to the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise now our God and King. Rise to the Lord, praise the Lord. Rise to the Lord, rise, gonna rise. Rise to the Lord, praise the Lord. Rise to the Lord, rise, gonna rise. Rise to the Lord, praise the Lord. A sentence that was repeated over and over. Anyone? How many times did I sing that? Five or six, okay. Any other suggestions? We're going to listen again. Keep track of it this time. Ready? And lift up your voice and sing. Rise, children, go and praise the Lord. Praise now our God and King. Rise, children, go and praise the Lord. Rise, children, go and rise, go and rise. Rise, children, go and praise the Lord. Rise, children, go and rise, go and rise. Rise, children, go and praise the Lord. How many times? Four. Some people might say six because that sentence is almost repeated, but the last two words change. Very discriminatory listening along the way. Would you sing the phrase that repeats over and over? <coughs> Lift up your voice and sing. Rise, children, gonna praise the Lord. Praise now our God and King. Rise, children, gonna praise the Lord. Rise, children, gonna rise, gonna rise. Rise, children, gonna praise the Lord. Rise, children, gonna rise, gonna rise. Rise, children, gonna praise the Lord. All your flocks and all that, and come on down. We're going to make a circle <laughs> down here. <laughs> and it will be an oblong, not quite a true circle. <laughs> Spread back a little bit that way so we get everybody in the circle. And contrary to popular belief, we're going to take and hold our neighbor's hands. We won't get any bad <laughs> What we're going to do is every time we hear the word rise, we're going to rise. Okay. All right. Lift up your voice and sing. Rise, children, gonna praise the Lord. Praise now our God and King. Rise, children, gonna praise the Lord. Rise, children, gonna rise, gonna rise. Rise, children, gonna praise the Lord. Rise, children, gonna rise, gonna rise. Rise, children, gonna praise the Lord. All of a sudden, your vocal height is getting taller because of the gesture. You also always came in on time. And now there's a different electricity running through the group. The best choirs in the world, literally all over the world, at some point will hold hands or figure out a way to be touching. And all of a sudden, there's sound. So I see an Olaf does it, Carthage Choir did it. And something we don't see it, it's very subtle. But it changes, it makes real human connection. We do the same thing again. Sing whatever words you can remember. <laughs> All right, ready? Here we go. Lift up your voice and sing. Rise, children, of the praise the Lord. Praise now our God and King. Rise, children, of the praise the Lord. Rise, children, of the rise of the rise. Rise, children, of the praise of the rise. Rise, children, of the rise of the rise. One, we're going to find out what the pew looks like in a minute, or a, a cannon. If you would turn this way as best you can, I put a little chart on the board, and I put some houses here. That's going to be our home base. I put a triangle down here. We're going to dip down the low for that one to find the pitch. And then above the houses are some squares that have become like little steps. So if I told you that the home base was this note, and that the triangle was this note, could you sing Lulu and finish the sentence? Here we go. Lulu. Okay, you should be a little scared of these, but they'll figure out it's just up the scale. Here we go, one more. 
more time. <laughs> Remember it all 
started with the cat who loved to sing. The question is, are you that cat? <laughs> go and go and curve you.